I'm Dr. Joanne Sweezy, Director of the University of Arizona Cancer Center. I'm your MC as well as a presenter for today's inaugural event to introduce you to the Ginny L. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute and to celebrate the 65th anniversary of Ginny Clements Breast Cancer Survivorship. In doing so, we honor all breast cancer survivors. Let's take a moment to silently honor these brave souls as well as all those who have been diagnosed with breast cancer. Because of Jenny's phenomenally generous donation, we also have the privilege to introduce you to the opportunities we will have available to us at the Ginny L. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute to expand our innovative and impactful breast cancer research. Today, leaders from the University of Arizona Cancer Center will be providing an overview of our current breast cancer program. You will be hearing from Dr. Pavani Chalasani, Dr. Joyce Schroeder, Dr. Judith Sue, and Dr. Terry Badger. Each will provide brief overviews of their cutting edge, innovative breast cancer research. Their comments will address our future goals and expectations for the quantum strides we will make in breast cancer research as a result of Ginny L. Clement's generous gift. So settle in from the comfort of your homes and offices as we celebrate all breast cancer survivors and provide new hope for breast cancer research. I'd like to begin our program by introducing Dr. Robert C. Robbins, the 22nd president of the University of Arizona. Dr. Robbins, thank you for joining us today. Dr. Sweezy, thank you for inviting me to say a few words. And Jenny, thank you for being here. It, uh, it just shows that miracles still happen 65 years later. That's just incredible, absolutely incredible. I, I wanted to start with my remarks by thanking you for everything you've done for the University of Arizona, the incredible impact that you've had not only on this research center, but across the university in multiple ways. Since 1989, you've been a valued and trusted advisor, philanthropic partner, cheerleader extraordinaire, and an exemplary role model as a volunteer for the University of Arizona. And this just by my naming a few of these cherished relationships that you have with the university and with me. Today, on your 65th anniversary of your breast cancer survivalship, I feel so fortunate as your friend and also as the president of the University of Arizona to celebrate this remarkable milestone with you. So thank you for being here. Your transformative donation to create the Jenny L. Clemens Breast Cancer Research Institute is an integral component of your living legacy, truly your living legacy, to honor all breast cancer survivors and to provide the means and the added motivation for our University of Arizona Cancer Center breast cancer team to march into new frontiers for innovative discoveries. Jenny, you know that your breast cancer survivorship is nothing short of a miracle. As a physician considering your breast cancer journey and the discussions we've had about that, I can't help but compare the cancer treatment in the mid-1950s to today. There have been phenomenal progress made in cancer research and treatments that Dr. Sweezy has outlined and you'll hear more about later. Certainly in the 1950s, breast cancer was primarily treated by radical surgery. And before I became a heart surgeon, I was a general surgeon in training and, and saw that, the devastation that that brought to 
hundreds of thousands, if not millions of women. That was supplemented with radiation therapy and uh, as, as a part of their treatment plan. In the 1950s, chemotherapy was still in its formative stage and wasn't really offered. Today, however, breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer among women. According to the American Cancer Society, 268,000 plus women and actually 2,670 men were diagnosed with breast cancer in the United States in 2019. Even though any diagnosis of breast cancer is one too many, in contrast to the 1950s, our society has benefited from significant changes in how we approach breast cancer research and treatments. Just to name a few, genetic testing, which has been really uh, revolutionary in how breast cancer is, is dealt with today. Certain surgical advances, advances in reconstruction, and better side effect management of chemotherapy are all important advancements. Today, breast cancer is seen as a disease with many different subtypes, with different patterns and ways of acting on the body with more tailored and personal, personalized treatment options. I, I would dare say that breast cancer is truly an individual disease now with different strategies to treat it. These improvements and new therapeutic options are a huge advancement for humanity and have been accomplished over time with contributions of many bright and passionate individuals. At the University of Arizona Cancer Center, we are so very fortunate to have many of these visionary researchers and clinicians as integral members of our team. Jenny, I look forward to celebrating your 66th anniversary with you next year and to sharing with our audience the cutting edge research and treatments that will have been developed and achieved at the Jenny L. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute. Thank you for all for being here today and Jenny especially thank you. Good afternoon. Before I start my speech, I want to go a little backwards and talk to you about the team that helped me think about giving the University of Arizona a cancer center research institute. First of all, it started with Mono O'Connell. Mono, I know you're listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was because of what we talked about that gave me so much thought and interest in doing this. Then I had a dinner with Dr. Robbins and John Paul Rosenek, and I told them what my thoughts were and what did I wanted to do for the University of Arizona Cancer Center and they immediately said yes. Then there was Vicki Fleischer, who has been such an advocate for me. Clint, you have been a McCall, an advocate for me. And then there was beautiful, wonderful Dr. Sweezy, who came here and became the director of the University of Arizona Cancer Center. And now we have Elaine Cunningham, who's the I believe, Senior Vice President of Development. I want to thank all of you for what you've done for me because you were the catalyst that helped me decide to, to go ahead and make this gift. And again, thank you, Dr. Robbins, for those kind words. Leaving a breast cancer legacy is just a very small part of who I am and why I decided to make a donation to have a breast cancer research institute at the University of Arizona. Having experienced breast cancer at the age of 15 was especially tra traumatizing to me. So I decided that maybe I could help so many that I call my sisters and brothers that have experienced 
breast cancer for those who have passed away from this cancer through research. Those are the peoples that I want to touch with my donation. I believe research is the only answer to combat breast cancer. Working together, we all can make a difference. As the saying goes, it takes a village. That is not only the research and the university team, but donors who partner with me to make a difference by donating to the Jenny L. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute. When I am asked why the U of A and why now, why not the University of Arizona and the University of Arizona Cancer Center? They both are an integral part of our community. The team at the University of Arizona that I have collaborated with during this past year, year and a half, have been a cohesive part of my journey, as I said before, to make this donation a reality for breast cancer research in every way. I believe that timing is everything in life. The U of A has very strong leadership, which made my decision to make this gift an easy reality and to be able to see it grow during my lifetime. I hope that through research at the Jenny L. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute that a cure discovery is found or a drug is found to eradicate breast cancer. I know it can be accomplished if we all work together towards these go goals. Thank you again and God bless. Jenny, I just want to say thank you and congratulations for this uh, special day, your 65 years of being cancer free. Hello everyone, I'm J.P. Rosniak, President and CEO of the University of Arizona Foundation. On behalf of the University of Arizona Foundation, thank you for your long-standing partnership, service, and friendship. Back in 2006, you decided to speak publicly about your breast cancer experience for the first time. You did this to inspire other diagnosed people with breast cancer. That same year, you established a fund to support breast cancer research at the University of Arizona Cancer Center. Since that time, 300 donors have been inspired to join you in your mission to cure breast cancer. Those contributions have funded close to $1.1 million in research support, and that would not have happened without you. Ginny, anyone speaks with you can see how you've shaped the meaning and purpose from an unimaginable challenge in life. I'm honored that at the foundation and the university, we're able to share in that purpose alongside you through the Ginny L. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute and the Ginny L. Clements Breast Cancer Research Fund. Your personal stories and your cause have inspired so many others to share their stories. So today, I have the privilege of giving you this memory box. And inside that memory box, we've collected notes of thanks, personal stories, photos of family and friends who have supported your institute in your name. Please accept this memory box as a gift of our ongoing recognition of your transformational support. Everyone who shares those notes is celebrating their appreciation of you and what you've done today. So, Jenny, please. Wow. You've, you've got a lot of reading to do. I sure do. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, JP. Thank you, Jenny. So now, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Michael Dake, Senior Vice President of the University of Arizona Health Sciences for the next portion of our program.
Good afternoon. I'm Mike Day, Senior Vice President for the University of Arizona Health Sciences. I'm delighted to be a part of this memorable 65th anniversary celebration of Jenny's breast cancer survivorship and overview of the Jenny L. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute. Congratulations, Jenny. You are truly an inspiration of hope to us all. As a physician and head of the University of Arizona Health Sciences, I have the distinct honor of leading and supporting the innovative training, cutting edge research and statewide outreach of our educators, researchers and clinicians who are each dedicated to improving healthcare. The University of Arizona Health Sciences is located on campuses in Tucson and Phoenix, and we are one of the top ranked academic medical centers in the Southwestern United States. Our five colleges and 12 centers work with partners and affiliates throughout the Arizona and the greater Southwest to address some of the most pervasive healthcare problems of the 21st century. As a leader in next generation education, biomedical research and public outreach, the University of Arizona Health Sciences employs nearly 5,000 people as approximately 4,000 students and 900 faculty members and garners more than $200 million in research grants and contracts annually. Our recent strategic plan centers around next generation education, precision healthcare for all, making wellness ageless, creating defenses against disease, and new frontiers for better health. In keeping with this strategic plan, the University of Arizona Cancer Center's vision is to be the preeminent leader in achieving freedom from cancer by extending and enhancing the lives of patients regionally, nationally, and around the world. During today's presentation, you will hear from Dr. Squeezy and her team of outstanding breast cancer researchers and clinicians about how they are implementing creative collaborations and advancing research-driven multidisciplinary cancer prevention and patient programs for our breast cancer patients. With the establishment of the Ginny L. Clemens Breast Cancer Research Institute, we are one step closer to a world where there are many more breast cancer survivors like Ginny and where breast cancer is no longer impacting the lives of so many people. It's my pleasure to turn the program over back now to Dr. Sweezy. I know you will be as inspired and encouraged as we are by their efforts. Thank you. I would like to express my gratitude to Ginny Clements for her transformational vision and support to create a Destination Breast Cancer Research Institute right here at the University of Arizona Cancer Center, the only NCI-designated comprehensive cancer center headquartered in the state of Arizona. And here you see a picture of the University of Arizona Cancer Center with the letters NCICCC, the NCI designation, on top of the picture of the cancer center. We've earned our National Cancer Institute Comprehensive Cancer Center designation as a result of our cutting edge research and extraordinary patient care here at the University of Arizona Cancer Center. It's important to note that patients, including breast cancer patients, who are treated at NCI designated comprehensive cancer centers experience significantly better outcomes than patients treated elsewhere. And again, I'd like to point out that the University of Arizona Cancer Center is the only National Cancer Institute Comprehensive Cancer Center headquartered in the state of Arizona. I am so pleased to introduce you to our breast cancer research team. In fact, the team is much larger than this. I could only fit this many individuals on this particular slide. It takes a team to meet the challenge of breast cancer because breast cancer is a series of incredibly challenging diseases. And it takes clinician researchers and basic researchers and prevention researchers and supportive care researchers to find solutions to these challenges that confront everyone with breast cancer. So today, myself along with my colleagues would like to introduce you to some of the breast cancer research and care that takes place at the University of Arizona Cancer Center as part of the Ginny L. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute. Here at the University of Arizona Cancer Center, breast cancer treatment and care and research is patient-centered. 
And today you'll hear about some of the amazing cutting edge research that's performed in the laboratories of the Ginio Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute. You'll hear about treatment and our multidisciplinary care teams that ensure that everything the patient needs is met and that plan incredible uh, treatment protocols so that outcomes are absolutely the best outcomes the, can the cancer patient uh, could experience. Uh, we also have prevention research at the Cancer Center in breast cancer. We're one of only five clinical trial network sites in the nation that administers prevention clinical trials, and we have several breast cancer prevention clinical trials currently onboarded at the University of Arizona Cancer Center. And of course, because breast cancer affects the patient and their families, we have incredible supportive care programs. We've long been known for our supportive care programs, but you'll hear about the successes of one of these programs today. And now let's talk more about the Ginny O. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute. The first thing I'd like to tell you is you've heard that Ginny Clements was 15 years old when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Ginny chose to turn this incredibly traumatic experience into a way to serve others by donating so that we could launch the Ginny O. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute at the University of Arizona Cancer Center and treat breast cancer patients so that they would not have to endure what she endured. Ginny, please accept my sincere appreciation for your gift. The mission of the Ginny O. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute is to provide the best cancer care for breast cancer patients in the state of Arizona and beyond through cutting edge research. So let me give you an update of our progress on the Ginny O. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute and our goal to make this a destination institute for breast cancer research and patient care right here at the University of Arizona Cancer Center. We've appointed an external advisory board of eminent scientists and a patient advocate. To ensure that we stay on track, we hire the very best researchers and cancer caregivers and advocates and clinician researchers at our institute. We've initiated a search for the inaugural director of the Ginny O. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute. And our next steps are to recruit additional members of the team, to renovate space and cultivate team science. The space will be wide open space so that members of multidisciplinary teams, clinician researchers, basic scientists, supportive care scientists can come together along with patient advocates and discuss the new cutting edge research and new ways of treating breast cancer patients right there within the University of Arizona Cancer Center. And we intend to raise additional philanthropy dollars to continue to expand this Breast Cancer Research Institute. And now I'd just like to give a brief overview of my own work in breast cancer research. I'm a basic scientist, but as I've told you, it takes a team. And this is the team that worked together with me on this particular novel treatment for breast cancer. On the left of the slide is Pat LaRusso, who's a renowned clinician trialist in breast cancer research and also a member of the external advisory board of the Janiel Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute. Next to her is Michael Krauthammer, a computational biologist, and then Isabel Alvarado and Mariam Mahmoud, both basic scientists who are lead authors on this paper. Pavani Chalasani is a member of our team here at the University of Arizona Cancer Center, and you'll be hearing from her shortly. And Kurt Schauper is an immunopathologist who's also part of this team. And I'd like to note that this research was supported by the National Cancer Institute, the University of Arizona Cancer Center, and the Yale University Cancer Center. So we know that treatment of breast cancer cells with a drug called a PARP inhibitor can kill the cells, especially if they have a mutation in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene. And we set out to treat some BRCA1 
deficient cells with a PARP inhibitor. And these are the BRCA1 deficient cells pictured in this image. And these aren't treated. These are just growing in a Petri dish. But then when we treated them with a PARP inhibitor, we noticed something very extraordinary. These cells are actually liberating their cytoplasmic DNA and all of those dots. They're liberating the DNA into the cytoplasm from the nucleus. And this is interesting because previous work by others had shown that when DNA enters the nucleus, it can release cytokines that attract the immune system. So the next question we asked, was the immune system being attracted? Because if the immune system is attracted into a breast cancer tumor, for example, it can kill the tumor. So we took this into a clinical trial, and this is a triple negative breast cancer tumor here that has a BRCA1 mutation before treatment with the PARP inhibitor. And in red and yellow dots, you can see that some of the immune cells are already present in that tumor. But after six weeks on a PARP inhibitor, look what happens. This tumor has an incredibly huge amount of immune infiltrate, meaning that this tumor has a huge chance of being killed by the patient's own immune system as a result of treatment with a PARP inhibitor. I'd like to thank you so much for the opportunity to present the Ginny O. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute and my own research today. And now, the next speaker is Dr. Pavani Chalasani. Thank you, Dr. Sweezy. I'm Pavani Chalasani, a breast cancer medical oncologist and leader of the Breast Cancer Clinical Research Team at the University of Arizona Cancer Center. I'm delighted to have an opportunity to talk about the breast cancer program at the Cancer Center. Breast cancer affects one in eight women in the United States. While there is still a lot of work to be done, there has been a steady increase in the number of patients living post-cancer, and that brings hope. As shown in this picture, earlier detection and novel treatments have improved outcomes. However, the diagnosis of cancer changes the person and their family. It affects their way of life. It is frequently divided as a pre-cancer life and a post-cancer life, and majority of the times, it's not the same. Breast cancer treatments has changed from seen by a surgeon, taken to surgery, sent to a medical oncologist, and then sent to a radiation oncologist, to a multidisciplinary approach where the entire team of physicians from medical oncology, breast surgery, radiation oncology, plastic surgery, pathologists, are brought together at the time of cancer diagnosis, coming up with the optimal treatments for the patient. As the treatment plan is decided, other important services like genetic counselors, nutritionists, physical therapists, social workers, palliative care specialists, financial navigators, integrative medicine specialists are also brought in with the goal to improve post-cancer life because we are going for a cure for our patients and we want to give the best opportunity that their post-cancer life continues to be good. An important part of what we do in addition to this multidisciplinary care here at the Cancer Center is clinical research. Clinical trials at the University of Arizona Cancer Center range from prevention, diagnosis, therapy trials, which are looking at new treatments or approaches in surgery, radiation, or new drugs, and also in survivorship. I want to give a few examples of the standard of care changing trials here at the University of Arizona Cancer Center. We are the lead site for the randomized phase two trial, which is looking at a new drug combination for the HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. This trial is currently open in 15 academic sites across the United States, with the University of Arizona Cancer Center being the lead on this. The next one is the physicians at the University of Arizona are national study leads in the National Cancer Institute trials, which set the new standard of care. One example is the currently ongoing study of a phase two randomized study looking at a new drug called Olaparib, which is administered or given in concurrent with radiation versus radiation therapy alone to improve the outcomes potentially for patients with inflammatory breast cancer. And that's the SWOG 1706 is a study number for that. With all things said and above, the heart and soul of what we do here or what we strive to improve is by translating our University of Arizona Cancer Center science 
translating it from bench to bedside by doing what we call as investigator-initiated trials. I'm just going to give an example of this. One example is a collaboration between Dr. Vanderoff and myself. We worked together to study opioid sparing therapy for patients with metastatic breast cancer. Frequently, when breast cancer spreads, it goes to the bone and it causes a lot of pain. One of the main treatments for it, that is opioids, which helps, but all of us are aware of the side effects and their concerns, which happen with you know, p- taking opioids and also the other um, concern for addiction. Dr. Van der Rohe's lab did some mice studies where they looked at the bone and the nerve tissue, and they found there was another receptor called CB2, which can be targeted. And based on this, I worked with him and conducted a clinical trial in patients. We completed the study successfully recently. I have a lab, but I do translational research, which means I study blood, cancer, tissue, and the urine changes which are happening, you know, with other uh, treatments or like tree, um, imaging or other, other um, modalities that we are trying to study. So in this collaboration, we did blood and urine-based changes which happened with pain and also with pain medications. They were tested and they were done in my lab, to, again, to study our study rationale. Based on our results, we applied for a provisional patent application last December. Since I mentioned earlier about translational studies, I just want to go over one more scenario, which is gaining a lot of interest in breast cancer. As everyone is aware, it takes decades to test new drugs, show how effective they are, and then they get approved. In breast cancer, because we can see the tumor in the breast, have access to it, and what I mean is we can actually biopsy it again if needed, we are able to test the tumors in a scenario what we call as window trials. So what that means is we can actually treat the patients with the tumor and then repeat the biopsy or you know, take them to surgery after treating them, and then we can see how the drugs actually affected the cancer directly. These are called window trials, and they actually help in development of novel therapies in a faster way. Two examples of these trials where the cancer center investigators are leading nationally and also within what, what we call as IITs, are looking at a new novel therapy for triple negative breast cancer by a drug called PARP inhibitor drugs. And another one is called ZNC5, which is a novel oral potent anti-estrogen therapy. In summary, we have the -the state-of-the-art multidisciplinary clinical team here at the University of Arizona Cancer Center. We do research from basic science to studying biology of cancer, understand new pathways on how cancer grows, to prevention, detection, novel treatments, and also in survivorship because every setting is critical for our patients and community. With Ginny's generous support and and creation of the Ginny L. Clemens Breast Cancer Research Institute, the Cancer Center is poised to take it to the next level and become a premier breast cancer institute of excellence. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Joyce Schroeder. I'm a professor of molecular and cellular biology at the Arizona Cancer Center. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we do in my laboratory where we focus on trying to understand what drives metastatic breast cancer. So in this first image I'm showing you now, we have some pictures of normal breast cells and cancerous breast cells. And it really demonstrates some of the key things that we see when we're comparing breast cancer to normal cells. And if you look at the images on the right, if you can see these bright green outlines of cells, these are all normal epithelial cells in, uh, from the breast, and, and they're doing what they're supposed to be. So you can see that they're sort of the same structure. They look very similar. They're all attached to each other, and they're doing their job as they're supposed to. So in the breast, this would be forming a duct, producing milk, feeding offspring, that sort of thing. And then you can compare that to the cells on the left, which I hope you can see look really different. And the cells on the left are from a metastatic breast cancer patient. And still, the outside of the cells are still labeled with green, but hopefully you can look and see that they look very different. So not only is that beautiful organization of the normal cells lost, they're sort of piled up on top of each other, they're doing their own thing. But if you look at that green edges, it really looks sort of spiky and invasive. And this is really representative of what metastatic breast cancer looks like. And it's one of the things that we're studying in my lab to try and understand what is causing this difference between the normal cells on the right and the metastatic breast cancer cells on the left. So in my lab, we focus on a subtype of breast cancer called triple negative breast cancer. And triple negative breast cancer is a highly metastatic disease. In breast cancer, it tends to metastasize to the brain, the lung, the liver, the bone. 
And when it metastasizes, this is when we have uh, a high death rate amongst patients. And so this is really the part of the disease that we want to focus on, try and understand, and try and develop therapeutic drugs for. The image on the right shows you some triple negative metastatic breast cancer cells that we've taken from a patient and are growing in the lab. And this sort of wavy stuff in the background of the cells, this is the tissue. So what we can do is take tissue cells out from a patient, put them on tissue in the lab, and then study what's going on inside them and see what, what sort of changes they're making, and then compare that to normal cells and, and, try and try and find the driver for the metastatic disease and then try and develop a therapy against it. So I'm showing you some images um, that were produced by two graduate students who were previously working in the lab, Atlantis Russ and Shauna Callan. And they were trying to understand this basic idea of if a protein is sitting on the cell surface in a normal cell. So you can see this again. This is this normal cell image on the left with these green proteins around the edges of the cell doing their job, communicating with the environment. Uh, what happens to them in metastatic breast cancer? And one of the first things they discovered was that they're actually not sitting on the cell surface in metastatic breast cancer like they're supposed to. In fact, they go all the way inside the cell to a new location where they take up a brand new role. And, the, and this new role actually helps drive migration and metastasis in breast cancer. And you can see that in the image on the right with the arrow with these bright yellow points of, cell, of these same proteins that used to be on the cell surface and now have gone inside. And so once we discovered that was happening, we tried to learn more about the process so we could try and target it. And the images I'm showing you now are from a different graduate student named Matt Hart, who graduated a few years ago, who worked on developing a drug to actually target that process. So this drug is called ENLS1, and the images in the middle are of metastatic breast cancer cells that were treated with the drug that he developed. So if you look at the two images on the left... On the top is just after he treats the cells with the drug. And then on the bottom left are what happens after a few uh, days after being treated with the drug. Essentially, the cells all die. They sort of explode by a very specific mechanism that causes them to die. And so we could see that this was happening to the metastatic breast cancer cells uh, in the lab. So next, we wanted to move this into a mouse model. Because if you want to understand metastasis, you have to develop a model in which cells can leave that primary site and metastasize to secondary organs, which is what happens to, into patients. So this is an example of an experiment in which we took a type of triple negative breast cancer called inflammatory breast cancer, and we injected this tumor type into the mouse, and the mouse will grow tumors and you can see this in the blue lines. You can see it rising up over time, that the tumors get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then in the red and the green lines, you can see that we take mice that have these tumors developed and we inject a drug into them, and the tumors really, really dissolve. And so this was really exciting to us, that not only could it do this in our cells in the lab, but we could actually take tumors growing in mice and get the same impact, that we could get the, t the tumors to not just stop growing, but to actually go away. And so this is the drug that we're focusing on now to take to clinical trials. Because when you think about what is the process by which you um, go from what I've described and that we try and figure out, you know, what is the basic thing going wrong, then we try and develop a therapy against that thing, then what do we do with it? Well, the things that we do with it are first... We take it to the FDA, and the FDA says, we want to make sure this isn't a toxic drug, because you know with, with the chemotherapies and, and other drugs that we have already, those are quite toxic. And so one of the goals that we have is not just to treat the cancer, but to do it in a non-toxic way. So this drug that I was just telling you about is now undergoing studies to find out whether or not it's toxic. And then once we know how toxic it is, then we can take that information, again, take it to the FDA, and get approval for a clinical trial. And so I'm now working with uh, clinicians in the cancer center to try and think about what we need to do to apply for that clinical trial. And so as I wrap things up here, I just want to um, say my thank yous, first off to the, to the students and uh, technicians in the lab who have done this work, but also before I leave the slide to our, our mouse patients who have been incredibly helpful to us in trying to understand what's going on. Of course, the human patients who provide the cells that allow us to investigate the problem. And then, um, obviously, to Ginny Clements. So Ginny Clements is one of the people who has funded this work research uh, over the years. And without her help, we couldn't have done a lot of what we've done. So thank you, Jenny. So it's my great pleasure to be here today to share with you the work that I'm doing in my lab, which is on developing ultra-sensitive optical sensors 
for a wide variety of applications, but in particular, uh, medical diagnostics. So our lab builds ultra-sensitive sensors for biological and chemical detection. Uh, we target a wide range of applications. So for example, early detection of cancer, Alzheimer's, performance enhancing drug detection, chemical threat sensing, water safety, food safety, environmental monitoring, and portable diagnostics. And for, in terms of medical diagnostics, we're interested in what I call creating a disease agnostic platform. So where we're developing a sensor that can detect diseases, a wide variety of diseases um, in a wide variety of bodily fluids. So any sort of fluid that contains a biomarker such as blood, urine, tears, sweat, uh, fecal matter, for example. And so the sensing platform that we use is shown in this slide. Um, it's called a whispering gallery mode microtoroid optical resonator. So it's about the diameter of a human hair. And I've put a red blood cell next to it for size comparison. And essentially what we do is we flow over any sort of biomarker containing solution over this. And we look in the, at the change in signal that we, that we get out. And so Optical whispering gallery mode resonators are named after the architectural phenomena known as the acoustic whispering gallery. And the most famous example of an acoustic whispering gallery is in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. So underneath the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, there's a gallery known as the whispering gallery. And if you're standing, you know, at one end of the gallery and your friend is standing 100 feet away, he or she can hear what you're saying because sound is traveling along the edges of the gallery with negligible loss. And so here's a picture of me on the left. Uh, this is the Temple of Heaven in Beijing, and it's called the Echo Wall. That I'm standing in front, and my husband's standing in the back, and he can hear what I'm saying, you know, even though we're far apart because sound is also traveling along the edges of this wall. And so our sensors operate on the same principle, except instead of sound, instead of sound traveling along the edges of the, an architectural feature, we have light traveling along the edges of what we call this microtoroid optical resonator. And so in this slide you see an artistic rendering and a simulation and the bright colors represent the light within the device. And light, it's, you can think of this as light traveling. It's very similar to how light travels through an optical fiber. So light travels through an optical fiber through total internal reflection. And you can think of this as an optical fiber that's sort of bent back on itself. Um, and so in this case, because the light is bent back on itself, it kind of loops around continuously, which you can sort of see in the simulation in the right. And the concept is, is that, you know, we bind biomarkers to the surface of our sensor. So we, we coat our sensor with capture agents such as like antibodies or DNA. And as biomarkers bind to these capture agents um, and the light is continuously circulating around and around, every time the light interacts with whatever is bound to its surface, it, it causes this increase in signal from our sensor. And because the light is going around and around, we get this large amplification of our signal, which enables us to do very ultra sensitive diagnostics. And so one of the first applications that we did was what we term a, met, a minimally invasive tumor biopsy. And so we implanted uh, tumor cells in a mouse. And the concept behind this is that um, the, the tumor cells are shedding these biomarkers known as exosomes into your bloodstream. And, and if you're able to you know, take a sample of this blood and sample these biomarkers, you, you're able to see is a tumor present and how far it's progressed without having to find or access the tumor. And this is a you know, great benefit in cases, you know, where people who, you know, are willing to be biopsied initially to find out what they have, but they're unwilling to be biopsied multiple times, um, you know, as their disease progresses. And so this is also a good way to sort of minimally invasively track disease progression. So for example, with regards to various treatments, how do biomarker levels fluctuate? So you can imagine that we have these sensors and we actually will have an array of these sensors and each sensor will be covered with a capture agent for a different biomarker. And the, the, this would allow us to look at panels of biomarkers, which are uh, you know, important because you know, diseases are often not diagnosed via one biomarker, but rather multiple biomarkers. And so here was some data that we had. So we implanted human Burkitt's lymphoma tumor cells in the mice. And we just looked at the signal from our sensor from week zero compared to later weeks. And you can see we get a, a much larger signal from our sensor at later weeks, uh, presumably because more and more of these biomarkers are binding to the surface of our sensor and generating this increase in signal. And we can also detect genetic markers for breast cancer. And we also did the control experiment where we looked at a mouse with no tumor. And then we looked at you know week one and week five and we didn't see a similar increase in signal from our sensor. 
And so where is this going? So in the future, we're interested in early identification of disease, ideally prior to physical presentation of symptoms. So we detect biomarkers, but we also collaborate with groups, for example, who do work in ovarian cancer and Lyme disease to search for new biomarkers, you know, for diseases that don't have any sort of known good biomarkers. Um, we're continually trying to improve our platform. So right now this is a research system, but we're interested in miniaturizing it, making it portable point of care, making it available in the hospital, the clinic, the workplace, the home. Uh, ideally we want this as prevalent as a blood pressure machine in a pharmacy or a mall. So you're shopping and you can just stop by and check out, you know, what biomarkers you have for a particular disease, for example. And I, the idea is that hopefully this would be made available to the public in less than 10 years. The technology is already fully licensed by Femta Race Technologies. We have several patents on this technology and this is a startup company that's based out of Italy. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge my team and all our sources of funding and thank you everyone for your attention. Hello, I'm Terry Badger, and I am the Eleanor Bounds Endowed Chair and Professor at the College of Nursing and a member of the University of Arizona Cancer Center. What we hope to accomplish with our SHINE research for cancer survivors and informal caregivers, and informal caregivers are family members and friends that help the cancer survivor through their journey, is to reduce psychological distress, such as depression, anxiety, and stress, plus other cancer-related symptoms, fatigue, insomnia, and pain. Not only do these occur during cancer treatment, but often linger up to five years after treatment ends. We want to improve health-related quality of life, psychological, physical, social, and spiritual well-being. We also want to be innovative in the fact that we want to provide accessible and effective psychosocial, both educational and counseling services using print and digital methods. In our case, we use the simple telephone. We have found that more people have access to a telephone than they do the web. However, we do have researchers that are also experimenting with using the web and other methods to reach our cancer survivors. And finally, we want to reduce health disparities for survivors and caregivers in our community. Now, how do we hope to accomplish this? Well, as part of our research, we call survivors and caregivers separately once a week for 12 weeks. We assess their symptoms and refer them to self-care strategies in our printed self-management and survivorship handbook, which we have mailed to them. You will see the cover here um, in this slide. We also have this available in Spanish, and each symptom has a definition, has self-care strategies, and how to talk to other people about the symptom, as well as when to uh, refer back to your provider. Now, if you're receiving counseling, our social worker calls you to, uh, for eight weeks weekly to provide counseling over the telephone. And again, everything is in English and Spanish based on your preference. The telephone allows for access because it removes barriers of language, uh, transportation, time off work, etc. Now let me give you an example. This is Don and Donna. Um, she had breast cancer. Both are in their mid-50s. They lived about two out hours outside of Tucson, but they came to the cancer center for their treatment. She worked in the school system. He was self-employed. We provided symptom management and counseling over the telephone at times convenient for them. I typically talk with one around lunchtime and one a little bit after work. This supportive care service allowed for them to access the needed services and not miss work, which was very important to them. It reduced psychological distress associated with cancer and its treatment. It improved their finances because they didn't have to miss work, and it improved their communication with others. And over the course of the treatment, we became very close, and so Don gave me a call to share the secret celebration at, for the end of cancer treatment. He bought Donna a new car because he didn't want her to have to drive around in her old car, which she associated with the two-hour drive into Tucson to obtain cancer treatment. So here are our investigators in the Symptoms Health Innovations and Equity Group. Uh, to my left is Dr. Chris Segrin. He is a professor in the Department of Communications, and he is a social uh, scientist who's very interested in, in, the, in 
uh, the dyadic interdependence between cancer survivors and caregivers. You have already talked uh, and heard from uh, Dr. Uh, Chalasani. Uh, I'm the only nurse. Then we have Dr. Alice Sikorsky, who is our methodologist and statistician. On the bottom row are a group of investigators doing other kinds of research. Dr. Tad Pace uh, does compassion-based training with cancer survivors and caregivers. He's also very interested in the stress inflammation response, which is important in cancer recovery. Dr. Jessica Rainbow next to him. She is doing uh, research on financial toxicity and worker productivity with cancer survivors and caregivers. Next to her is Dr. Echo Warner, who does research in all sorts of and types of uh, social media. As you probably are aware, there's millions of bytes of data that are uh, that join the social media uh, and the internet every day. And Dr. Warner is working on a way to enable our cancer survivors and caregivers to be able to separate fact from fiction so they have the correct information to make decisions and move forward. And Dr. Tracy Crane, Dr. Crane does lifestyle interventions, and she has some very innovative research to help cancer survivors and caregivers eat uh, an improved diet, uh, increase their physical activity, and to stop tobacco products. And together, all of these researchers, all of this research, together with clinicians and patients and families, we're working together because we hope to become a nation in which all people affected by cancer have access to quality psychosocial care to optimize health co- outcomes. Thank you. We hope our presentations have provided a window into our current breast cancer research and hope for the future of breast cancer research. My colleagues and I would like to discuss some of the questions we've received from our patients and others over time. We hope these will be helpful to you, too. I'd like to start with a question for all of our panelists. How do you think the research you're doing today will change the treatment and prevention of breast cancer in five to 10 years? So, they're so talking about prevention. So one of the thing is these are for patients who are at risk, or actually they, we shouldn't be calling them patients. You know, these are women or men who are at risk of developing breast cancer. So what could we do? So in types of lifestyle interventions, or because of family history, they are at higher risk. So maybe developing new ways. I mean, one of the drugs that we have available is called tamoxifen. There is another medicine called Avista. These are available, but they do come with their side effect profile, and not everyone is keen on taking them because they come with other side effects. So there is active research going on in developing drugs which don't have the side effects, actually delivering drugs as a gel, you know, so that you can just apply topically in breasts, and which will reduce the tissue density rather than actually getting absorbed into the blood, you know. So there's a lot of new um, research and new things in terms of technologies also. So that is for drugs. In terms of technologies, now we have 3D mammograms available, which are actually better at looking at the pictures. I mean, the, when they came on and that we started looking at the tumor images, they are so different. And you know, it's just looking at something which is just like popping up now compared to what the 2D images we had before. So there's definitely advances there. A new things here at the Cancer Center, at the amazing research we do, they're looking at a very low dose CT to look at you know, these patients who have, or women who have really dense breast tissue and we can't really identify where mammograms are not good, but having a new 3D low-dose CT mechanism. So new technologies and new medications to kind of help, but importantly, diet, exercise, lifestyle, and education of our community will also help. You know, we've been treating breast cancer for decades with uh, drugs that actually damage DNA. And so we, we really have to learn how DNA damage, first of all, leads to breast cancer, and secondly, can be used to treat breast cancer. And so we also have precision medicine now. So you and I are collaborating on, on a, a study to look at some of the DNA repair mutations in breast cancer that may predispose people, 
but may also be the Achilles heel of the tumor. For example, like BRCA1 and BRCA2. So that's, a, that's another thing that is just amazing today uh, that's going to really help us understand how to treat breast cancer yeah. better. Yeah, and I feel like all these collaborations and things like that which happen and which are only going to get better with our research institute is bench to bedside and then back to bench side, right? So that's a whole loop, and I think that's where you know institutions and collaborations actually help. Exactly. And certainly we're, we're all collaborating because we do believe in a whole person approach, a patient center approach. So we really want to look, as uh, Dr. Chalasani said, across, uh, across multiple different domains so that we're looking at new drugs, we're looking at better drugs, but we're also looking at better ways to provide supportive care, change lifestyle so that we can prevent cancers in the future. Absolutely. And, and if we really want to develop targeted therapeutics that are going to help our patients, we really have to spend a lot more time understanding the basics of the disease. We've, myself and colleagues around the world have spent decades trying to understand how breast cancer forms, why it survives in metastatic sites, and there's, we've learned a lot, but there's still so much more we need to learn just by doing the basic science for that. And uh, it's, it's a really important base for everything that comes behind it. We can't develop great drugs if we don't know what we need to target. Right, so basic science is critical to the next discoveries and the patient. It's entirely patient-centered. It has to be. So Dr. Chalasani and Dr. Badger, you're both involved with clinical trials through a different perspective. We've heard from patients that thought being asked to enroll in a clinical trial meant their treatment options had run out. Is that true? And will you describe the process for being enrolled in a clinical trial in your area? Well, certainly um, I don't agree that your treatment options have run out. I certainly think that there's lots of different clinical trials that will expose you to some new and innovative methods. If you want to become a part of any of my trials, there's two simple ways to do it. You can either email me at tbadger at arizona.edu, tell me that your name, your phone number, and when you would like to be called, and I'll have the research team follow up. The second way to do it that's really easy is you Google nursing, Arizona, and shine. Uh, those three words, if you put in nursing, Arizona, and shine, S-H-I-N-E, it will immediately take you to the web page. It's available in English and Spanish. You can then uh, put in your name, your phone number, and when we, you would like to be called, and we will call you and give you the information you need in order to make an informed decision about participating in the studies. Yeah, so um, with regards to the treatment options and uh, clinical trials, so just like what Terry was saying, I agree with her. You know, there are options and there are treatments, but it all depends on individual patients or individual persons. There's condition and their scenario. So we have to take that into account and offer what are the next options. Um, frequently, when patients say they don't have any options or we tend to do it, that is typically when they have metastatic cancer or a stage four, as we call, and towards multiple lines of treatments. Um, we have a lot of phase one trials, like looking at novel drugs, you know, like the ones Dr. Schroeder was mentioning, you know, early ones that we are developing and bringing first in human trials. There are lots of options there, but at the same time, as a clinician, you know, we talk to them, figure out if that is the best thing, because we also want to do what is right for the patient, too, and make sure that is there. Uh, it's um, scary sometimes to look and do your own searches or things, but Google does is, is a friend here, so there are websites online. You can Google our Cancer Center website. There are clinical trial options, and you can look up there. Or just email, like Dr. Badger swears. Like, all of us are very responsive. I'm happy to, like, I screen a lot of emails and actually answer quite a few. Uh, just, you know, 
putting the, and uh, contacting them and going through. And actually, we answer and screen a lot of calls across the nation that we get through for clinical trials, too. And there's also information on our from our research team is available online on the website at the Cancer Center. So there are multiple venues, but at the end of the day, it's simple. Just Google our things and just email, and we can also help you. So that way, the burden is not on the patients, too. That's what we do. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Schroeder, this is a twofold question for you. What is your personal ultimate goal to, for breast cancer drug discovery, and how close is drug discovery for be, breast cancer drugs to finding better treatments? My personal ultimate goal is to find a therapy that completely destroys the cancer cell, leaving the normal cells intact and untouched. That's a very big goal, though. The more that we learn, the more we realize how similar cancer is to normal cells, which is really the crux of the problem, is finding what that difference is. So my hope is that every time we discover something new, we find a way to target it, and um, sooner rather than later, one of these things are going to be the home run that we're looking for. We all know that this is, this is a timed event. We need it now. We need it yesterday. And unfortunately, we know that it takes a long time to do these things. So, you know, we're all working as hard as we can to find something that meets those goals as fast as we can. Right, and the benefits of an NCI-designated comprehensive cancer center like the University of Arizona Cancer Center and the Jenny L. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute is that the basic scientists work with translational scientists, clinician researchers to get things into the clinic as quickly as possible in a patient-centered way. Absolutely. Pavni and I work very closely thinking about what we've learned, what we're developing, and how that's going to impact the patients. And, and we meet very frequently thinking about how, what those phase one clinical trials will look like. And I, as a clinician and as a translation researcher, I think it's critical because what I see in clinic, I can always run by and touch base with you. And I'm constantly amazed because, you know, all of you, like you, Joanne, like, you know, Terry and Joyce, like all of us just like to discuss, you know, what's relevant in clinic and then take it and then take it back. So that continuous back and forth between clinic and lab is what makes places like this the best. Absolutely. <laughs> So, Dr. Chalasani, how does a patient go about making an appointment at the Ginny L. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute? What if I know someone that would like a second opinion? So, um, again, websites, online, sometimes it's challenging, but uh, um, email is good. Actually, I'm not uh, making it up, but there are so many emails I get about, you know, hey, there's someone is there, can we do it? So, frequently that's easier. However, there are clinic numbers and our uh, phone numbers and clinics. Everything is available online, so it's simple. Just calling the number, and we see patients within three days. And uh, for every new, pa new breast cancer patient is seen within three days. So we have a quick turnaround. We try to get back to patients so, so that they have access to us. Email me, jsweezy at arizona.edu. I'll forward the email to Dr. Chelsani. <laughs> yes, and we, will, we do get patients in, everyone. And I think I can vouch for it, like anyone who sent an email has been getting in right away. <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you, team, for joining me today to share this information about our cancer center. These are very exciting, hopeful times for breast cancer treatment and research. I'd like to thank our audience for joining us today to celebrate the 65th anniversary of Ginny L. Clements Breast Cancer Survivorship and to honor all breast cancer survivors. It has been our pleasure to open the door to the Ginny L. Clements Breast Cancer Research Institute. We invite you back on April 12th, 2022 to celebrate again, to hear of our breast cancer research updates and how we will be approaching the next chapter of our research. Please check our University of Arizona Cancer website to stay informed of all our research. Take care and goodbye.